this is hosted under our platform Aksha, uh, which brings forth innovative and transformative ideas to shape India's progress in health and development. Uh, before I begin this important discussion, uh, let me introduce myself. I've had the opportun opportunity of working with many of you, but there are some faces I see which I don't know. Uh, so I'm, I'm Alkesh Vadwani. I oversee our work for the global growth and opportunities uh, in India, which consists of four areas, uh, agriculture, financial inclusion, gender, and sanitation. Uh, and I'm keen to hear from uh, all of the participants about w their thoughts about making markets work for the poor. Uh, let me introduce the guests for this panel. Uh, thank you, Secretary Ayer, for being here uh, and for taking time out for this event. Uh, I think many of you know Secretary Ayer. He's the Secretary of the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, but more importantly, oversees our PM's very important initiative, the Swachh Bharat Mission. Uh, next, we have uh, Roger Voris who is uh, the executive director of uh, growth and uh, Global Growth and Opportunities Division in the foundation. Uh, he's come here for a few days, and we have a great opportunity to see him here. Uh, Ms. Mirai Chatterjee, thank you for being here. She's a key functionary of SEVA, which again needs no introduction. Uh, Ms. Mukherjee, who is... Uh, founder of Kaleidoscope, a uh, financial institution. I, well, maybe that's uh, not the right term, more of a uh, fintech firm uh, that's looking at using digital to reach poor customers. And Dr. Dr. P.K. Joshi, who's the director at IFPRI. Uh, finally, Varad is going to be moderating the session, so I welcome you and ask you to say a few words. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alkesh. And uh, to, uh, today's topic is perhaps one of the um, often discussed topic in development literature around making markets uh, work. Uh, to what extent can we rely on markets to address the most intractable development problems? Um, but today we want to go beyond abstract theory, ideological discussions and really learn from practice uh, and from lived experiences of uh, the great panelists we have today, um, to talk, uh, which we have from government, from the private sector, uh, foundations, and think tanks, uh, all, all included. Um, so I think uh, looking forward to this discussion, first I would like to invite Roger uh, to uh, kick things off. Roger, as uh, Alkesh mentioned, is the executive director at the uh, Gates Foundation looking at agriculture, financial services, gender, <coughs> water sanitation, and hygiene. Hope I haven't missed anything. You did, uh, you did so great. That, um, uh, and I know that you have a bunch of experience, both in the private sector and now at the foundation. Uh, so looking forward to uh, having you pick, pick us off. This one. All right. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. And it's actually great to be back in India. And um, we got to had a Fantastic time so far. Our entire leadership team is here. And we got to spend the day yesterday in Bihar and see some of the great work on the ground, including a lot of the work in the sanitation field. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing the Secretary's remarks. I probably will start off today just by telling you that at the core, if I can. Ah, voila. <laughs> I'm going backwards. At the core of what the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's work is the simple belief that all lives have equal value. And no matter where you were born or the circumstances you inherited, you really have a right to live a healthy and productive life. But the challenge is that even though everyone, that all lives have equal value, not all lives right now have equal opportunity. And our challenge today as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is to partner with all of you and including governments around the world, to drive the kind of economic access and opportunity that we know brings people out of poverty. One of the things I'll start out is saying that India and the world have made significant progress towards bringing all lives having equal value over the last uh, decades through scientific advances, 
efforts by government and the global community have substantially reduced child mortality and, and maternal mortality. And the incidence of debilitating diseases such as tuberculosis, malaria, have fallen dramatically. HIV is no longer a death sentence. Polio has decreased by 99%. And bringing it on the edge and the verge of being the second <laughs> disease to be eliminated after smallpox. But there's still a lot more to be done. Now, one of the things that we always like to put out at the Gates Foundation is the incredible progress the world has made in reducing the absolute number of people living in poverty. Over the last 25 years, that number has fallen dramatically. And yet, deeply rooted systematic poverty still is the truth for nearly 800 million people around the world. And if we're going to make the Sustainable Development Goals, India has an incredible role to play in that, with nearly 270 million people still living in extreme poverty of under $1.90 a day. Now, one of the challenges we have as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is to understand a really difficult, but it should be a simple question, why fundamentally are people poor? And governments and private sector have tried to address this from a variety of methods and methodologies ranging from that if people could just be better educated, or if they would only work harder, or if they only would be more industrious and adopt the right kinds of policies. But I think if we look at the arc of history, there are two important lessons we try and walk away with. One is that people are not statically poor, but rather every three to four years, somewhere between 10 and 40% of people below the poverty line escape out of poverty. The challenge is that nearly 10 to 30% of those same people fall back into poverty, and therefore creating a cycle of rising and falling out of poverty. Now, while that may seem discouraging, it's also a great opportunity because any differential we can make that actually helps people hang on to the gains they've made or buffers them from how far they fall back into poverty over time has a significant effect in driving down the number of people who live in absolute poverty. The second reality is that the vast majority of the reasons people are poor or stay poor is that the very systems designed to buffer us from risk or to give us opportunity actually oftentimes are not built for low-income people and families and therefore, they can't participate in those markets in ways that are meaningful or allow them to live up to their full potential. In many ways, the markets fail to provide for the needs of low-income people. And we see this all over the world. Take financial services for the poor, for example. Nearly half the world was unbanked when the millennium changed to 2000. Now think about that. Some countries in, developing, in the developing world we're only serving 10 to 20 percent of the world of their population. Yet central banks have a mandate to serve the entire population, and yet anywhere from 60 to 80 percent were left out. Or take the case of gender equality. Recent study by McKinsey and Company found globally that 12 trillion dollars could be added to GDP in the world economy simply if men were paid the same, if women were paid the same as men. And yet we ask ourselves, because we're all hunting for GDP, why is it that those markets fail to provide? And what we would argue at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is that it is really a matter of designing the right kinds of policies that are inclusive, applying the right kinds of technologies that change the cost structure of reaching low-income families, and then actually deploying that infrastructure in a way that people can develop solutions like we're going to hear around today that actually serve to low-income people and help them rise out of poverty, help them buffer against the risks they face, and help them absorb the shocks that happen. Because over 65% of the shocks low-income people face that push them deeper into poverty are health shocks. So if you look across the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you'll see that the main things we work on in my division are agricultural development, financial services for the poor, water, sanitation, and hygiene, and gender equality. And then the other two-thirds of the foundation are in health. 
So in reality, these are the major systems that countries and people need in order to help them lift themselves out of poverty and buffer themselves against the risk. From the foundation's inception, it's been focused on addressing the problems that most seriously imperil health and well-being for poor families. At Global Growth and Opportunity, we're trying to advance this mission of helping to improve the financial, technological, infrastructure, regulatory, and social systems that can enable low-income people, and especially women and girls, to more fully participate in the economy and their society. Around this, let me talk to just a few minutes in each of the big areas that we face. The first is agricultural development. Now, I know that there has been tremendous progress made in agricultural development in India. And one of the Green Revolution poster childs for growth and opportunity has happened here in the Indian subcontinent. And yet, the challenges remain of what's going to have to happen, which is increased food availability, or increased productivity by nearly 50 to 70 percent by 2050 if we're going to feed the world population. And if you look at India alone, you're going to have to grow the population and the number of uh, smallholder farmers who have to produce food up to reach a new population in the next few years to 260 million people. So GGO's agricultural development tries to build on the lessons that we've learned around the world, which is that almost no country has come out of poverty in an inclusive way without having agricultural development at the center of that. And that means we need an inclusive ad system that drives productivity for smallholder farmers, as well as provides opportunities for those farmers, once they increase their productivity, to diversify and transition to other kinds of employment, if necessary, if that's where they want to go, or at least diversify the crops that they invest in. Therefore, our agricultural strategy is focusing on leveraging technology advances, generating new scientific breakthroughs, and making those innovations available for resource-poor farmers. We believe that access to better data, digital tools, improved technology and innovation for farmers can boost yields and productivity and transform their farms <laughs> into thriving businesses. Remember that in India, they have 25%, or we have 25% of the world's smallholder farmers living in India. And yet our productivity lags behind what it needs to be if we're going to drive the productivity and food security we need. And we believe at the Gates Foundation that technology is one of the ways we drive that through our genetic gains work. And where that shows up in India is investment in livestock is one of the important levers for achieving inclusive ag transformation. We've partnered in broadening, broadening access to productivity enhancing hus animal husbandry, practices in modern production technologies to increase productivity and generate more farm income, and increase consumption of nutritious animal sourced food. India is the world's largest milk producer and there is rapidly growing demand for milk and established local demand of at least 200 million metric tons by 2022. One of the technologies that we've invested in is actually different kinds of AI. And I know if we were in Bangalore, they would think that means artificial intelligence. But in the world we work in, it means artificial insemination. And how do we actually get sex semen into the hands of smallholder farmers to improve the genetics and the productivity of milk production in the country? The second area is financial services for the poor, where India right now is serving as a model for the world. It drove a whole new model of how we would bring about financial access to low-income people by changing the banking system to incorporate new models of payment banks, to building shared societal platforms through the India stack of the universal payment interface and allowing new innovations on those platforms to drive new access to payment technology, new access to credit, and new forms of digital savings. The power of that is amazing. We all know that Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Prize, what, 20 years ago. 
But the power of that at that time was reaching anywhere between three to 500 million people. Since 2011, new technology and new payment systems have brought 1.2 billion people into the financial system. And they did that in five to six years. Now, India, in a very short time, has brought hundreds of millions of new people in through the government's program of PMJDY. And now, through the new payment bank technology, that's actually deepening to new kinds of access to sustainable ways that markets will engage. And we're looking forward to India being a model for the world of how this can happen at scale and at speed and from what the technology is showing and the data is showing empirically, bringing real livelihood effects to low-income people throughout the population. The other areas that we focus on are water sanitation and hygiene. And with the, with the secretary in the panel today, the Swatch Bharat mission and the government of India under the leadership of Secretary Iyer, who's present here today, and the Ministry of Urban Development has made a strong commitment to end open defecation, which spreads microorganisms that cause disease and deaths to over 200,000 children a year. Today, close to 70% of human waste generated across the urban India, seep, uh, urban India seeps into the environment untreated, adversely affecting public health outcomes. But centralized sewage systems are simply far too expensive, requiring lots of water and energy given that more than 60% of urban households use on-site sanitation system, such as septic mm. tanks and pit latrines, decentralized non-sewer solutions have a bigger role to play. The Gates Foundation has supported this through fecal sludge management and treatment plants, with an example in Devanali near Bangalore City, and the plant separates liquid from solid waste, treats both to remove the pathogens, and having visited there on more than one occasion, I can tell you that it doesn't smell. There are people who sometimes come and take pictures of fecal sludge treatment plants for weddings, and it's actually a tremendous solution that both economically viable, but also transformation from a health perspective. And finally, our newest strategy, which is gender equality. Poverty by its most, poverty by its most present state is sexist in that it leaves women and girls intergenerationally behind. And our newest strategy is really focused on how we find the intersection of where low-income people can actually come out of poverty and that women can actually be more effective, participate more fully, and begin to drive the kinds of GDP and the kinds of household growth that both empower women economically, but also empower them socially. <coughs> So the focus of our work is particularly relevant in India where women's work participation and access to assets are particularly poor. At 17%, <coughs> India has a lower share of women's contribution to GDP than the global average of 37. And labor force participation by women is low at 29%. Therefore, our work going forward and the commitment of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is to focus on key areas of women's economic empowerment. And our work in India will be with partners like yourselves and with the government of India to focus on connecting women to decent work opportunities, ensuring women's financial inclusion, and understanding what work and what works to build women's access to property and assets, as well as strengthening women's collective. And I'll close with that because we were in Bihar yesterday and I have to say, we were so impressed as a leadership team of the incredible empowerment and strength and the business skills we saw from the self-help groups that we got to meet with yesterday. And we left inspired that some of the poorest people in the world were driving new models of innovation, driving new access to markets through both lychees, mangoes, and maize. But most importantly, we're building the next generation of households where they saw opportunity and empowerment, and they saw their ability to change their communities. And that was most inspiring of all. So thank you for letting you, us partner with you. Thank you for showing up today. And thanks for all the encouragement and wisdom we've learned from India. And we're looking forward to that continued 
um, interaction. So thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Roger, for setting the stage for that. I take away two or three things which I think are quite profound. One, I think, is we sometimes fail to recognize the progress that we've made. Very often, we get caught in the challenges ahead. Sometimes it can sound quite gloomy. But I think the, the uh, data you showed on how much progress we've actually made is, uh, is a great uh, thing to just keep reminding ourselves of. The second, I think you said poverty. Um, it's really not a static concept. It's actually a much more nuanced thing, and we need to sort of move away from things like just the poverty line, et cetera, to think about uh, a much more comprehensive set of solutions. And thirdly, I think this notion of a stack, the metaphor of a stack that you were using here, which combines both the, the hardware and the software, so to speak, of uh, development, I think was really interesting. So Thank thanks you. for laying the, laying the stage for that. Um, so now I have the privilege of calling um, Secretary Paramayar to, uh, to say a few words. Um, Secretary Ayer is somebody who I call an insider, outsider, insider in government. <laughs> Started his career as a civil servant, um, then spent several years at the World Bank in, um, in many countries, and then um, came back to India to take on perhaps the most challenging job in the government, uh, to fulfill the goal of uh, open defecation free India that the Prime Minister announced from the ramparts of the Red Fort. And for those of you who don't know him, he has a very hands-on approach to his work. He's, uh, um, he not only notes his numbers and his office on what's the unfinished agenda, uh, but also rolls up his sleeves and actually gets involved in uh, some of the aspects of uh, uh, the physical aspects of doing the work to send the message that no task is too menial when you have to achieve this ambitious goal. So Param, uh, thanks for being here. And it'd be great for the audience to hear from you how you can combine the power of the state communities and markets sure. to uh, achieve this. Thank you, Varit. Uh, good evening to everybody. So let me just start out by uh, touching upon a little bit about what Roger spoke about. You know, there is a, I think there's a sanitation revolution going on in rural India. And I'm sure many of you would have been out there. So it's, there's an exciting revolution going on. We have women masons in Jharkhand called Rani Mistris. So Raj Mestri is the term in Hindi for a, for a male mason. There are over a lakh, over 100,000 women masons who are going out earning a living, again, talking about the power of the market, for poor women. They're going out and building toilets, which are being used. We have school children all over the country who are uh, advocating for sanitation, not just in schools, but pressurizing their parents to build toilets at home. And I can see uh, Ankur there from BBC Social Media. Again, there's a great film, if you haven't seen it, about a schoolgirl called Lavanya from Karnataka, who actually made her entire village open defecation free. So there's something going on in rural India, and which the Prime Minister calls a Jan Andolan, uh, a people's movement. And I think that's at the heart of what the Swaj Bharat mission is all about. It's about how people have taken charge of, in many ways, of their own development from a sanitation point of view. So while that is going on, what exactly are we trying to achieve in this program? So when the Prime Minister announced the Swaj Bharat mission, he spoke about it for the first time on 15th August 2014, when he said that uh, he spoke about the need to empower women and girls, and he put sanitation very squarely on the national development agenda. That was the first time any Prime Minister had spoken about sanitation from the ramparts of the Red Fort. And it was quite a shocker for many people. I was listening to the speech in Vietnam. So I was in the bank, uh, based in Hanoi. And my wife and I were listening to the Prime Minister's first Independent Day speech. And I was totally blown away. And I was telling my wife, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here in Hanoi. We should, I should be back in India. And then it happened uh, you know, a year and a half later. So it's an incredible privilege to be uh, associated with this program. Essentially, we are trying to shift uh, behavior. This is deeply ingrained behavior of people who have been used to defecating in the open for centuries. And I was discussing with some colleagues this morning, so why is it so difficult? And there are a number of reasons for this. But I think that uh, combining behavior change at scale there were 600 million people in India who defecated in the open when this program started. 
50 million were in urban India, and the bulk, of course, 550 million were in rural India. Today, that 550 million is less than 100. So there's been a huge shift in sanitation coverage. The good news is that usage of toilets, which is all about at the heart of this program, is above 90 percent. Three independent uh, verification surveys, the most recent under the World Bank support project, have shown that usage is above 90 percent. So that means that the behavior change is working. Now, this shift is quite unprecedented. Uh, it's never happened before. The challenge, of course, is which we're working on, how do you sustain this? Now, why is sanitation important? Let me take a step back. Now, I think I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but let me just uh, list again what are the three or four reasons why we think sanitation is really important. The most obvious, at least in rural India, is the security and dignity of women. And there's been a huge leadership role of women. They've got empowered. The ripple effect of sanitation has been incredible. They've gone into leadership positions. They're actually taken charge. And then there's the health impact. So we had a, a, a nice study by the Gates Foundation, which showed us that uh, health, whether you look at diarrhea, whether you look at stunting, whether you look at wasting, all of them are significantly lower in an open defecation-free district compared to a non-ODF district. There's an economic impact. There was a study by UNICEF which showed that a household can actually save up to 50,000 rupees in an ODF village. And this comes from avoided medical costs, uh, time saving, real estate increase, many other reasons. So it's, it's also a marketing tool. If your village becomes ODF, you know, some doctors will be out of business and you know, you'll save a lot of money. Many reasons, childhood stunting, clear connection between the lack of sanitation and childhood stunting. That's got another impact on the Skills India program, the productivity of our kids. There are many good reasons which I don't need to go on about. Now, the, uh, the question is, how is it being done? And many people ask us that question. So, and how is behavior change being actually implemented and rolled out at such a scale, which makes it so, so challenging? They, we look at it at sort of two ends. At one end, you have mass media, which we use a lot of. Uh, the foundation helped us with a couple of campaigns. We've had uh, Bollywood stars coming out and doing campaigns like Darwaza Band. We've even had a, a Bollywood movie called Toilet Ek Prem Katha, which was extremely useful in the heartland of India from an IEC point of view. All this is very useful. Uh, but for us, the most critical part of the behavior change campaign is that interpersonal communication. So we have uh, ground level motivators who are trained in community approaches to sanitation. We call them swachha grahis. And uh, that's the term actually the prime minister coined. So these are volunteers who get an incentive to go out, communicate, uh, make people understand why is sanitation important, and essentially to go out and trigger that change and make villages open defecation free. So we have over 450,000 of these grassroots level volunteers. They need to be trained, they need to be retrained, and they need to be retained as well. So they've got a role not only in helping to trigger behavior change, to go out and actually talk to real people, but also to sustain uh, this whole sanitation movement, which I'll come to shortly. So that's broadly how we work. Institutionally, we use you know, something I've said many times, I'm sure you've all heard it before. We use that time-worn formula from which we, I'm from the UP cadre of the IAS, which we use, which is called the PM, CM, DM, and we added VM to it, the village motivator formula. And that's precisely how this program is running. Young collectors who can converge, who can bring all their government departments, programs to converge at the grassroots level, whether it's the Anganwadi worker, the Asha worker, the Swachagrahi, the village worker, they all come together. And I think that's the power of the district administration. So it's not a Sarkari program because the village motivator is a private individual for the most part. So that's the sort of access, if you like, in terms of implementation. In terms of financing, there is, you know, sanitation is a public good. We think there are, uh, you know, positive externalities, as we all know. So the government is investing a lot of funds in this program. By the time the Swaj Bharat Minish would have uh, finished, we are getting close to the end of this mission. We are at about 86%. I think over $20 billion would have been spent from the public exchequer. That's center and states together. On top of this, a lot of employment is generated. A lot of masons are out there. Uh, 
so the supply chain, so it's, the market is working in many cases. Uh, one area we need to focus more upon is market interventions in solid and liquid waste management, which for us is the next frontier. We also have a large number of census towns, which are, they sound like they're urban, but actually technically rural, urban in characteristics. So how do you bring about solid and liquid waste management? How do you do retrofitting of septic tanks? How do you do fecal sludge management, which Roger spoke about? By the way, that plant is a great plant in Devanahalli. I visited that plant myself. I think it's a very good model, which should be scaled up in many of our census towns. So solid liquid waste management again. Now, let me come back again to uh, the topic of today's uh, discussion, which is making markets work for poor people. And currently, uh, you know, while this is largely driven by the public sector and by the government, all, most of the actors are from the private sector, but they're local private sector. We also think there is a role for the corporate sector. Uh, we, have got, we have been very fortunate to have some good partnerships with the corporate sector. The Tata Trusts have given us a very, very useful resource, young professionals, one for each district in India. We call them Zilla Swaj Bharat Preraks. So they are the eyes and ears of the collector who's very busy. Uh, they also give feedback to us in the government of India, and they help uh, sort of driving this program at the grassroots level. We also have close uh, uh, partnerships with the Sanitation Coalition. I don't know if Nena, anyone from Nena's team is here, so they again bring in expertise from the private sector. I think in terms of behavior change, you know, government, we don't have comparative advantage in changing behavior, so we depend on private sector, CSOs, NGOs, people who actually interact with people on the ground. So again, a lot of partnerships. Uh, this program is all about how we work with development partners, with, with CSOs, with NGOs. Most of all, it's driven at the local level. So what is our role in the government of India? We provide technical assistance. We provide incentive funding. We have got convening power. And of course, we uh, make a bit of a nuisance of ourselves in reaching out to states. And so, uh, you know, I've been out, I've been in this job for about two years, two years plus. I've traveled over 110 times because the action is in the field. So our job is to meet chief ministers. We advocate for sanitation. How can we put sanitation and hygiene on the top of the state's agenda? How can we put it on top of the chief secretary's agenda? So unless we can move it up, right now it's, you know, it's pretty high out there. We are very fortunate, of course, that we have got, uh, you know, the prime minister who has been backing us all the way, and that makes a very big difference. So that level of political commitment, I don't think we have seen in any other program in India, I could fairly confidently say. You know, there's a very high level of political support. There's consensus across all states that this program is one of their top priorities, if not the top priority. And that's one of the reasons why it, this program has been relatively successful so far. Going forward, solid, you know, what we call ODFS, the ODF needs to be sustained. And uh, we are now developing a 10-year strategy to lay out what are those key elements which need to be in place uh, as Swaj Bharat gets achieved. The Prime Minister set a deadline of October 2nd, 2019. We will definitely be on track to achieve that. But we want to set in place systems which will ensure that whatever gains have been made are sustained. So there's a protocol for ODFS. We bring in states and districts which have achieved ODF, which have sustained it. We get others to learn from that. So that is a major agenda which is already on. In addition to that, we have ODF Plus, which is solid and liquid waste management. Once you have an ODF village, it needs to be swatch. It needs to be clean. And it needs to have liquid waste management, uh, whether that's gray water or kitchen water. Is that being disposed of safely? We need solid waste management. Now, traditionally, solid waste has been more of an urban theme. But increasingly, in, you know, that distinction between urban and rural is getting quite blurred. So we are focusing on that as well. The good news is that in the independent verification survey which took place a couple of months ago, they found that about 70% of villages have effective solid waste and liquid waste as well. So uh, good progress so far, lots of more work to be done. And uh, for us, the next 10 months or so will be very important in achieving that main goal of making India open defecation free. And then of course, what are those systems in place and how can we draw upon the power of the market to sustain this? Are there local entrepreneurs who can do solid and liquid waste management? How can we incentivize them? And how do we put in place systems which will keep this going for a very long time? Thank you. Thank you. Uh
Thank you, Param, for that uh, whirlwind tour of what has been achieved, which is truly remarkable, I think, in the last few years. And for those of you who don't follow Param on Twitter, please do. You get your daily dose of inspiration from his 110 uh, trips and counting uh, across, across the country. And just on that note of social media, I think we have a hashtag called equal is greater. So please uh, use that uh, generously if you're into social media. <coughs> I wanted to move to the panel discussion and bring in some of our other guests as well. Um, but just before that, I wanted to say something in terms of this whole discussion on the rich and the poor and, and so on, which are often used. And uh, recognizing that there is a lot of debate in India on India's income pyramid and um, what really constitutes um, our different poverty line and so on and so forth. Uh, so without going into some of those um, challenges of, uh, of definition methodology, the one framing that uh, uh, I think is quite useful to set the stage for this is that is being increasingly used in, uh, in, um, in, in the discussion, which is to think of almost like three Indias. Think of India 1, which is, uh, uh, which is about 15% of the population, about 180 million people in India today earn more than 30,000 rupees uh, per month household income. So that sort of India 1, uh, I think most of us in this room sit in that. You can call that shining India or whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's an India 2, uh, which is sort of the next, uh, the rising India, if you will. 30% of India, about 360 to 400 million people earning between 12 and 30,000 rupees household income per month. So that's sort of the next, uh, what you can call as the India 2. Uh, and then there is the India 3, which is 55%, um, uh, uh, 550 million, uh, less, earning less than 12,000 rupees uh, per month household income. So. So that is a nice sort of framing to sort of bring some nuance to this discussion on the, on the rich and poor. Um, so I think that a couple of interesting implications here. One, I think, is what we traditionally call the middle class is essentially India 1, uh, because I think when we think about it, it's people who are sort of earning more than 30,000 rupees household income per month. I think that's interesting. There's been a lot of debate about India's missing middle class and so on and so forth. I think the second is just on the, um, the value paradox, which is that we all know the 80-20 rule, uh, but if you think about consumption by these three Indias, uh, the data is perhaps even more stark. So some analysis that we did recently on the digital payment sector, for example, shows that um, India 1, what I described as 15%, actually has about 80 to 85% of the market, and the rest is in India 2 and India 3. So there's a genuine value versus population paradox, which also makes the whole markets working for the poor question uh, a more challenging one. And then thirdly, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, a lot of research over the last decade uh, has shown that uh, these are very different uh, segments in terms of uh, needs, aspirations, attitudes, and behaviors. And it's, it's quite important to think about nuanced ways and nuanced strategies when we think about this, uh, this uh, especially the India 2 and India 3 <coughs> in the country. Uh, some new work that uh, is being done uh, with the foundation, uh, the Center for Social and Behavior Change at Ashoka, and, and uh, my organization, Dalberg, on trying to understand and sub-segment uh, these masses. And I won't bore you with the details of that, except that I'll try and show you a three-minute film at the end to uh, just give you the highlights of what we are seeing. Uh, so with that, um, I would love to move to uh, the panelists. And maybe we can start just the first question around this whole um, definition of the poor uh, kind of thing. I think we all bring different uh, different perspectives. And maybe, Sucharita, I can start with you. I know at some point you'll have to leave. And you've, been gen you've generously stayed on uh, for this panel, so thank you for that. Uh, and I know you've got tons of experience between <laughs> IFMR, KGFS, and now Kaleidofin. Uh, and I, I know you're a great pro proponent of starting consumer first as a business, which is what uh, you're doing right now. So how do you think about uh, both understanding and serving uh, the poor as a consumer, if I may use that phrase? Yeah. Uh, so in, a, in my experience over the last sort of uh, uh, almost 12 years in this uh, segment, what we found about uh, sort of poor uh, customers who are largely in the informal sector, um, so that's number one. Most of the poor work in the informal sector have no documented source of income, which automatically makes them, you know, in today's world, data poor. But are they rational? Yes, they are perfectly rational. They are very smart. So let me give you an example. 
uh, why do uh, poor customers pledge their gold and take expensive loans? And a lot of people say that, well, even with microfinance institutions, even with self-help groups, why are poor people still doing that? It's because uh, essentially if you think about a gold loan, it's available for a period of two days or 30 days, it's available for any amount. And if you think about, you know, even though the interest rate might be higher, the absolute cost of credit, if you only needed money for one month for 4,000 rupees, is still lesser. So they're actually making a very rational choice when they're pledging their gold. So it's not, you know, it is always a bit more nuanced. It's not interest rate versus interest rate. And the MFI is providing them a minimum 25,000 rupee loan, you know, equal amortizing installments, and their life doesn't work in equal amortizing installments. So we need better product design. So what we've realized is that poor customers are indeed very rational when it comes to making choices. That's uh, number one. They work in the informal sector. They are very credit worthy. Uh, I think because access to formal credit has been so hard to find and when they actually get access to formal credit they will uh, you know research even shows uh, you know quite heartbreakingly that uh, they will even reduce food consumption in order to pay debt uh, which i'm sure india one customers will not do likely at least top part of india one customers will not will certainly not do but extremely conscious of the fact that access to formal credit is not something they can take for granted and that is also one of the big reasons moral hazard has traditionally been very low because there are two ways in which you evaluate credit risk, moral hazard and capacity to pay and on moral hazard this customer actually scores very very highly and the third aspect is that in which you know uh, poor customers are different is that they have very very volatile lives um, and uh, again, primary research shows that the volatility of incomes is about 45%, 50%. Volatility of expenses is again about 45-50%. So you can imagine your surpluses are volatile by 100%. That's a big number and therefore we do need to revisit financial solutions design in light of this fact. This is a very big fact. It's challenging but it's very solvable. Great. So rational um, volatile incomes, but most importantly, credit worthy and reliable. I think that's a nice uh, sort of takeaway. Dr. Joshi, let me bring you in. And you have spent a career working with uh, on the problems of the small and marginal farmer in this country. And sort of perhaps take a producer lens. The farmer is essentially the poor as a producer. Um, what are some of the um, sort of challenges you've seen for, uh, for the small and marginal farmer? when you think about markets, and market access is often talked about as one of those big, hard questions to solve in the agri-space. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think that uh, from a small, majority of the poor are living in rural areas. So rural area is number one. And the small and marginal farmer, because of their tiny land holdings, you know, majority of the farmers in India are small and marginal. Roughly 86% farmers are having land less than 2.5 hectares. And around 80% farmers have land less than point, less than one hectare. So this group of farmers, they have very low marketable surplus. When they have low marketable surplus, they do not have access to market. They do not have access to uh, credit, as she was ref referring, the financial inclusion is not there. A lack of access to the extension services. So basic services which are necessary for small and marginal farmers are not available to them. This is number one. Second is the income level. Their income is so low that it affects their consumption basket. There is a low diet diversity of the small and marginal farmers as compared to the uh, rich farmers or the urban, urban, urban population. So diet diversity is being considered that if you have better diet diversity, then the, uh, your nutrition level is much, much better. And these farmers who produce for us, they are facing the triple burden of malnutrition. You know, one is the food insecurity. They are food insecure. They are producing food, but they are food insecure. They do not have sufficient calories to eat from the, what they are producing. The second is undernourishment. Undernourishment is widespread in the families of the small and marginal farmer. <laughs> and third is the, now the new issue is coming up is the over, you know, un, because of imbalance of dietary patterns. 
the obesity and the overweight is coming up. So these are the three problems which are which you know marginal and small farmers are facing. Yeah. This is number one. Second is that they do not have access to the markets. Lots of reforms are taking place. I am very happy that the the Jandhan Yojana have been initiated. Uh, the e-market, uh, I will come to later on, the e-market has come up. So all these you know, reforms are coming up. But what we feel, what we are realizing, uh, that these reforms are not inclusive reforms. So we need to see that how institutional issues can be linked with these reforms so that they can participate in these reforms and the benefits goes to these farmer communities. Yeah. I want to probe you a little bit more on that. We'll come to that in terms of the reforms. And I think a lot of things which are considered to be helping small and marginal farmers may actually be uh, challenging. But Birai, maybe I can move to you. And I think Seva is an organization that is, I think, universally respected in this country. And one of the things that I personally re greatly respect is your appetite for innovation and engaging with different kinds of players and not really having ideological um, sort of barriers to actually uh, looking at these things. So I think. When we're thinking about markets, and I know you've had a lot of experience working with the private sector, for example, uh, and creating your own institutions, market institutions as well, what are some of the big learnings that you have, uh, you have taken away, both the good and the, and the not so good? Sure. So um, I think the first thing is that we were forced to innovate and be resourceful. Because when we went to the mainstream banks, they told us, you're not bank. When we went to the mainstream insurance companies, they said, you're bad risk. So willy-nilly, we had to innovate and be resourceful. And we know from the experience of many in this room that the poor women of this country are extremely resourceful. They know how to innovate. They know how to manage with less. They know how to run lean organizations better than most of us do. Um, so that's the first point I wanted to make. Uh, if anyone would extend the hand and join, they're ready to join hands. Um, and one of the experiences that we've had was with micro-insurance. That's not much known. Seva Bank's experience is known. But as I mentioned, when we banged on the doors of the uh, nationalized insurance companies, they said, no, no, we can't insure poor women. You die too much, you get sick too much. It's, it, it's not really a, a good proposition at all. Uh, but slowly, we were able to show them that we are willing to contribute. We are not asking for a free ride here. Mm -hmm. But if we sit together at the table and develop products that we can afford, we are willing to pay for them. We want timely service, good claim servicing. So I think slowly, slowly, we were able to sit with the insurance companies. And over the last 25 years, Vimo Seva, which is Seva Insurance, has now built up a very good partnership with both private insurance companies, which came in later, and the public sector. Um, but it took a while. I remember one of the things that and it might seem surprising to this audience is that women's gynecological complaints were not covered by insurance companies. Because they didn't think that was something that we should bother about. Right. Or when we spoke about occupational health of informal women workers and explained to them that when she's milking a buffalo, sometimes you know she gets kicked and she may fracture her leg, and that is an occupational health condition. That is worth covering, or snake bite when she goes into the field. You know, these are things that were really way outside of the experience of the insurance companies. So we were able to bring this grassroots experience and reality, ground reality, if you will, and sit together and co-create. And I think that has been a really sure. exciting journey. Yeah. One sort of quick follow-up question to you, which is that you are a very unique organization, but you work with other organizations are very different, right? One example is, I think, Sucharita's organization, Kaleidofin, which sure. now you are collaborating with. How do you, um, you know, how do you sort of work effectively with org uh, organizations that have a very different DNA, uh, so to speak? What's the, what's the secret sauce for, of that? So I think for starters, it's our values and our ideology. We are an organization that is influenced by Mahatma Gandhi's thinking. And we do believe in partnerships and in working shoulder to shoulder with people. So we're open to that, first and foremost. Secondly, we have no illusions that we have all the answers or solutions. Um, we need the support of partners, experts, people from other countries who we've learned so much from, other organizations who are sitting in this room. I see my colleagues from Pradhan here. 
Um, so that's the other thing. And the third thing is that we sit together all the time with our sisters. We work together with them shoulder to shoulder, day after day, year after year. And we listen, we try to bring uh, our partners also into contact, and it's inspiring. Sure. Uh, typically what we hear insurance companies or others from the mainstream say was that, you know, this, these kind of insights we cannot imagine for people who hardly went to school. So I think it's a learning journey for everybody, sure. and it's a rich journey. Yeah. Um, and I think we humbly learn from each other. Great. I think that open-mindedness is, uh, is something which is pretty impressive. Um, Param, I wanted to ask you actually a slightly uh, provocative question, if you don't mind, uh, which is moving to the tack of markets to public policy. And one of the, I know you've sort of based the Swachh Bharat uh, on the pillar of Jan Andolan, uh, but some would also argue that the, the subsidy or the incentive, I know as you call it, um, which, uh, which is offered, is um, you know, potentially uh, a public policy intervention that is uh, not that helpful because you know, purists would point to the case of a Bangladesh or a Vietnam perhaps, etc., which have achieved tremendous successes in open defecation without a government subsidy slash incentive program. Uh, and you know, um, some the extremists would say it's, oh, you need to do behavior change without the carrot of, a, uh, of the incentive. What would you say to, uh, to, to sort of those critics? Sure. Now, you know, both the countries you have mentioned, they took, uh, you know, they took quite a long time to achieve what they achieved, and they had a fair amount of success. So as you mentioned, this is, it's an incentive. And by the way, uh, it's going to very poor people for the most part. So we're talking of poor people here. And incidentally, many communities have decided on their own what is that level of incentive which needs to be given. So the choice is with that rural community. So for example, in Bijnor in UP, I think in a village called Mubarakpur, the community decided that we don't need the incentive because we can afford it ourselves. So that flexibility is there, but for people who are really poor, uh, you know, they, they need that. So as far as we are concerned, our guidelines are very flexible. We think that it's important to invest in sanitation. And we think that this incentive, and people are spending their own money on top of that as well, if they can afford it. So uh, it's important from a public policy point of view to give them that incentive. And of course, beyond that, uh, you know, once we become ODF, the behavior change kicks in and people sustain it themselves. Uh, uh, so Charita, I know you probably need to leave shortly, so maybe I'll ask you one question before you, before you step out. Just building on this thing of, the role of public policy and the role of uh, enablers and so on in making markets succeed. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in financial services is this whole um, digital infrastructure that Roger also talked about here, and India being almost like an example for the world uh, with the Aadhaar and then building on it the India stack and so on. From a business perspective, uh, and especially when you're thinking of building a pro-poor business model, which you are trying to do, um, how useful or, or successful has it been? Is it really is it a lot of, um, um, a lot of rhetoric, but, or is it actually uh, helping you um, in, a, in a very substantial way in serving um, the customers that you have, uh, that you are seeking to serve? Um, so I, th I think it has uh, overall been pretty transformational. Uh, you know, I'll give you a small example of just you know how do you authenticate a customer? How do you know uh, that you know Varad is indeed Varad? Earlier, uh, you know, that used to be quite a task uh, of an, all kinds of documents, including voter's ID card, ration card, uh, et cetera, used to be collected physically, which costs a lot of money, authenticated, letters would be given from the panchayat, from, uh, you know, an IS officer, et cetera, to ensure that, you know, you really are you. And therefore, I mean, uh, that whole business of authenticating people was uh, very, very inefficient. So Aadhaar indeed has made a big difference because today, for example, when we are delivering financial solutions which are personalized to each customer, uh, we can do uh, the EKYC, the e-signature. We can even sign contracts uh, completely digitally without the movement or use of any paper. Uh, whatsoever because the legal frameworks allow that and the India stack uh, can provide that authentication for the signature. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I do think that 
uh, a lot of businesses still have to adapt. Uh, so when we talk to banks and we say that you can actually give loans without you know, without wet signatures, they're like, no, it's, you know, the compliance departments are up in arms and they say it's not possible. It's there. Uh, but, uh, so I think the, um, the adoption still has to come and there are only very few people who are actually adapting because the current uh, the participants in the market are sort of sure. resisting the change. Um, uh, on the other hand, I would still say that the cost of all of these uh, services, so for example, EKYC, sign, uh, e-mandates is still very high and uh, it's not immaterial at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it probably costs 150 rupees to set all of this up, just pure cost. And that's a significant barrier if you think of, you know, even an India 2 customer earning under 30,000 You think rupees. that's a transitional problem or you think it's... No, it's, I mean, today that is the cost. I mean, so it's a public policy question as to mm -hmm. who for these customers should the, should there be a way of uh, making uh, this transition easier? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, could that be a place for uh, government or yeah. philanthropic institutions to participate? Because we do find it, it's not an insurmountable barrier, but it's a barrier uh, nonetheless. I think the other, uh, uh, you know, the, the other issue is that customers don't quite own their own data. Mm -hmm. And if, if they did, they would be much more powerful. So actually yes. everybody else owns their data. Uh, so, uh, you know, so they are, uh, you know, they're getting insured, they're getting subsidies, they have bank account statements, but they're not in control of all of this information. Yeah. And there is a framework that is, you know, uh, it's called the account aggregator that's in the works, but not yet active. But that, again, would really empower customers because now the information is in their hands yeah. and they can leverage it to get better financial services. Uh, but the ownership actually needs to be put in their hands and that framework needs to be actioned really urgently. Sure, yeah. And I know you need to leave, so uh, thanks for being with us. No, thank you uh, so but much. But I think the idea that you mentioned, uh, which is just worth emphasizing for this group, is this data fiduciary idea, right? Which is that a new class of intermediaries who can actually look after the interests of the, of the consumer, uh, or the data giver, as opposed to uh, the interests of the data collector. And India really has an opportunity to leapfrog many other Correct. countries in, in that way. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you Tereza. so much. Um, Roger, maybe over to you and maybe uh, zoom out a little bit. Uh, this discussion on public policy, uh, markets, and I know uh, as, the, as a foundation you have tried to do a lot of both. Um, and I guess the question is, at a more meta level, um, how do you think about balancing out, you know, uh, working with this, uh, you know, the, the government versus um, you know, the, the private sector, uh, broadly speaking? No, it's a great question. And I think both of your last examples, whether that is, is sanitation or financial inclusion are places where there is both an intersection of public and the private sector together. Um, I think the way we think about it is, if we think about why markets don't work for low-income people, Part of the reason is that the policies are not designed in a way that really drive low-income people or they're not fair for them. So we heard you had all of this ID. You used to have to provide the, the global cost structure of IDing someone is somewhere between $10 and $12. That was just simply unaffordable. Low-income people would have to get a passport or a driver's license. They had no need for those things. And so we actually try and say, what are the public policies that should be in place to make those markets inclusive. But the other side, it's not that the private sector is always just not wanting to deal with those customers. Sometimes it's true, but other times it's that the cost structure is just too high or the lot size, the transaction size is too small. And that's where technology has made huge differences and therefore allowed us to move from a cost structure that was 10 to $12 to onboard to one to two there are some countries that are doing it for just a few cents. That makes a radical difference of bringing low-income people in. You, you mentioned Bangladesh and, and sanitation. Tremendous progress on open defecation, but what we would argue and what I think has been appreciated in the Indian context is that 
you have to think about the end-to-end -end solution of fecal sludge management, mm -hmm. because while over 90% of Bangladeshis are not open defecating, yeah. only a few percentage points are actually safely treated fecal sludge. Yeah. And so and that's where this comes together. Well, what are the right business models that make that possible in India? Yeah. Government of India is driving new solutions to think about this through end-to-end. -end. And like the Gates Foundation is trying to say, OK, how do we do reinvent the toilet so that we don't have to build really large, expensive sewer systems, but there's a way to safely manage? Yeah. So we actually see it not as one versus the other, but as a real partnership. Mm -hmm. But you've got to get the policy right you got to get the economics right. And then you have to provide a way for low-income people's voice and social change mm -hmm. to be reflected in those structures. Yeah. And that sometimes is a really hard piece of it. And we've seen that with smallholder farmers. And IFPRI knows that data around the world best of all. Yeah. yeah, and I think one of the images which is embedded in my mind is I think one of the slides that Madhu showed in one of the presentations, which is how the sewage flows from yeah. um, mm. you know, the toilet to actually a safe uh, disposal thing and how the leakages are in many, in mo many cities of uh, uh, sort of more than 80, 90% is sort of uh, leaked in unsanitary ways. Yeah, and you know, just to add to that, uh, I think Roger spoke about technology. Mm -hmm. So that's why in the Swaj Bharat mission, the technology which is being promoted for the most part is the twin pit toilet. Now, Bangladesh did mainly single pits. Mm -hmm. And that's why they now need to get into fecal sludge management. So the twin pit mm -hmm. model, which can be used for about 80, 85% uh, different parts of India, or covers most of it, it's, a simp it's an eco-friendly model. Yeah. Because when you shut one pit and you divert to mm -hmm. the second, the closed pit, year and a half, and then that safe compost. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have to worry about taking it out and dumping it in a water body because you don't have effective fecal sludge management. So that technology, and other, uh, but this is low cost as well. Yeah. So that's why it's, it's the preferred choice. So I think that's, again, it's important yeah. to make sure that you get the technology right. And this is purely from a, a twin, you know, a toilet point yeah. of view. And it's a pretty, I mean, simple stuff. It's not yeah. some high-end software or yeah. something like that, which is great. So I wanted to also bring in the uh, discussion on collectives. And Param spoke a little bit about community mobilization being the, really the heart and soul of Swachh Bharat. Um, Joshiji, maybe you can reflect a little. I know you're a great advocate of farmer producer organizations as a, as a great way forward for the smallholder farmer in India. But the fact is that uh, FPOs in India have really struggled. Um, dairy, of course, is probably one uh, example where it has succeeded. Dairy has very particular characteristics, uh, probably that make it uh, relatively easy. What do we do beyond dairy? Can we make farmer producer organizations actually work for the smallholder farmer in India? Is there something in the power of collecti uh, collectives there that can, uh, that can help? Now, if we have to solve the problems of farmers in India, we have to bring them together. Farmers are to be, uh, they produce together and they market together. Unless they do this, I think their incomes levels are not going to increase. So often I say that Indian agriculture is crowded, risky, and inequitable. So you have to revert it then I think we have to, what we have to do, we have to bring them together to increase their incomes and to reduce their risk and also bring them more equitable, their distribution of income is more equitable. The devil so is here, in the details. Yeah. So how do you make them so make here, it work? Yeah, so here, you know, Government of India already have one program where they are promoting farmer producer organization. There's a uh, organization known as Small Farmer Agri Business Consortia. It was started since, you know, 20 years ago. But we have forgotten in between the farmer producer, this farmer produce, this small farmer business uh, consortia. But recently now, the government is putting, coming up more aggressively to promote farmer producer organization. And you have seen that in recent budget also, an incentive was given. These farmer producer organizations were giving income tax. And the exemption was that now any farmer organization has turnover of 100 crores, they are exempted from the income tax. There's big incentive for the farmer producer organization. A lot of incentives are given to become the membership of the farmer producer organization. So there is a movement to make more and more farmer producer organization. Right now in India, less than 1,000 farmers organizations are there. Yeah. But I think that India should have more than 50,000 of farmers producer organization and much more than that. Is but there a good model you have seen which can yeah, scale? I, I, I tell you, what, what is happening? You know, what is happening in farmer-producer organization that the, they have a very good linkage at the back end. 
Backend means they are getting access to fertilizer, they are dealing directly with the dealers or the factories. So seed, fertilizer, pesticide, they are directly dealing and reducing their input costs. So on that front they are reducing just dramatically their cost, which must be reduced. But in front end they are, you know, they had to be linked with some markets. Either these retail chains or hospitals or educational institutions or midday meal schemes. So they have to link with them. Yeah. Unfortunately, they are not able to link with because the agriculture they have produce of one time produce. These retail chains, educational institutions, hostels, hospitals, hotels, they need supply regularly on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So the firms which are demanding they cannot you know, go to several of the farmer producer organizations. So there are good examples from the Africa. So what they have done, they have federated these farmer producer organizations. If there is a tomato farmer producer organization, so all tomato farmer producer organizations, they have a federation. So once you federate, so the buyer will only approach to the federation and then federation will, you know, them ask them to deliver these material here and there. Sure. So this is one thing. Yeah. The second is the success model is you mentioned that dairy sector, we have very, the cooperative model was very, very successful. It's a model at the global level. And on the basis of Amul model, there are several, uh, these uh, cooperatives, uh, milk cooperatives have come up in uh, many of the states. Now, National Dairy Development Board is promoting farmer producer organizations in milk production. So this is another you know, way of approaching farmers to come together at their own, bring their company and then sell milk, brand it. Yeah. The second very important model is the poultry sector. The poultry sector, we have the contract farm. 80% of the poultry, you know, agriculture is completely unorganized sector. But poultry sector is 80% poultry is under organized sector. And there is a strong linkage between private sector, the corporate houses, and the farming communities. And this has led to a poultry revolution in India. The growth of the poultry was more than 12% during last decade. So it was so high, and it also giving high income to the farmers. And there are switch from low rem re less remunerative crops to the poultry sector. So there is a switch from you know, sorghum, palm millet, ragi, these crops are giving low returns to the farmer in rain-fed areas. Yeah. So they shifted to the poultry sector. You will see that the all, most of the southern India, they have this poultry sector is coming up in a big way and they are earning a very highly. So rapid. different models for different yeah. uh, types of things. Different and I think there's of definitely things. something in this yeah. federation idea that you're the talking federation about. Federation and then it, also yeah. the, uh, the cluster farming. The cluster farming, Chhattisgarh started with cluster farming. They, they, one village will have produced only one or two commodities yeah. and they collect and then they will sell in Calcutta market. Yeah. So there are different models which are coming up. Only thing is that how to bring them together, the farmers, their production and then yeah. marketing. So I want, do want to bring in the audience but one more question to you Mirai because we can't have a discussion on collective without bringing in Seva okay. which is probably the uh, exemplary, exemplary example in the country. Uh, what do you think? Is there, uh, is there sort of a natural scale to which some of these organizations can grow? Should we be thinking more on the grounds of uh, replication as opposed to scale? Uh, what sort of your experience from SEVA? Uh, so, first and foremost, I think uh, what we've learned, if there's one thing we've learned in the last 45 years, is that the basic building block is organizing, which is mm -hmm. bringing women together into their own sustainable membership-based organizations, um, which, by the way, also help them stand firm in the marketplace. I mean, individually, she doesn't stand a chance, but together, she's a force. Collective strength, her bargaining power, and just one quick example, since you also had an example from the agriculture sector. When we formed women farmers into their own cooperatives, they actually managed to even get a place for the first time ever in the APMC market, the wholesale market, right. a woman run, all women run, women farmer run shop. So they could get remunerative prices and also break into this sort of male dominated APMC market. So all sorts of exciting things happen when the collective forms. I think a couple of things, um, I think first and foremost, uh, especially with women collectives, it takes us time. I think there's a lot of pressure always, scale up, you know, hurry up, this, that. Right. I mean, we are slow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, slow and steady we know. 
wins the race in the end and the reason we're slow is because we do 150 different things. We do paid work, we do unpaid work, we take care of our children, we take care of elderly. Is that a breadth versus depth trade-off? Um, yes and no. I mean, I wouldn't say a blanket yes. But I think we have to be patient. We have to let people build at their own speed. And there are plenty of examples of scaling up. There are also plenty of examples of excellent sort of small is beautiful. And perhaps, as Dr. Joshi has mentioned, the way to go there is to federate these decentralized small collectives. So I think, you know, we can't just have one blanket, this is how it works and this is. But I think some of the challenges, two or three of the challenges I want to mention uh, that we've seen is that poor women's collectives, membership-based organizations, they can grow, they will grow, as I said, give them time. But another important point is an enabling environment particularly for women's collectives. Uh, because of the whole range of activities, economic and household activities that women are involved in, they need support. We heard about low workforce participation. Our studies show that just by introducing full day childcare uh, for working women, women's incomes double. I mean, how are women going to enter markets and into the economy? if these sorts of things are not taken care of. And we've made a start with ICDS, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. It has to be tailored, speaking of systems, the systems have to be tailored according to their reality sure. and their needs. And then only with this kind of enabling environment, their organizations grow and prosper. And the best thing we've seen is that many of them are financially viable, plus democratically women are elected to the boards and the executive committees, and they run. And 80% of our boards and committees are the poor women themselves, and a few people like myself who are there as a support. But increasingly, they're reading balance sheets, they're asking questions, they're okay. ready to go. Great. So on that optimistic note, let's uh, bring in the audience and your burning questions. Um, um, I think somebody with the mics who, who, is, uh, who is available, please raise your hand. And, um, Introduce yourself, and uh, given the constraints of time, I'd request you to uh, keep your question brief uh, and uh, mention who you are, who you are, uh, uh, who's the question intended to. We'll take two or three questions and then come back to the panel together. Uh, the lady here, to start. Um, uh, stand up and. Uh, I'm uh, Maitri. Um, I'm a reporter with the Hindu Business Line. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Ayer regarding um, the toilet building. Uh, so I was recently in uh, Gorakhpur, in uh, one of those villages researching about why children get encephalitis. And uh, one of the questions that we were looking at was if the village was ODF free and they were slowly and steadily getting there. Um, but they uh, were complaining about the fact that uh, they were getting their incentives late uh, of the 12,000 rupees, they'd not even gotten their 6,000, uh, as also they were complaining about corruption. Uh, so a uh, siphoning off of incentives by uh, the panchayat leaders, by the patils, and uh, people who facilitate uh, passing these on to the people who build the, the toilets the beneficiaries. So how are you taking care of these facts? Should we take a couple more and then come back to the panel? Uh, gentleman here. Thank you. Um, really enjoyed the panel discussion. My question, I am Rajesh Chadda. I am from the National Council of Applied Economic Research. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Joshi. And in fact, it's, it's a very brief question. One, that uh, what we hear now is that it is production and productivity on the one hand, but monetization of the crops because of the farmer's income increasing, you know, the doubling would really happen when the net incomes increase. So uh, what, what, how do you see, if I give you one cue that I always have in mind, that when we talk of the markets and the farmers, is it right that we let the input subsidies go and give the direct benefit transfers to the farmers in lieu of the subsidies, let the markets work and let the farmers do buy the, their purchases, not at subsidized rates, but then give them DBTs, direct benefit transfers, in a way which becomes sure. uh, yeah. very transparent. We'll take one more. There was a hand at the back, I think. Um, Hello. Quick question. Time. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm Narendra Nath. I work with uh, Pradhan. It's an NGO. We work on rural livelihoods. So in a sense, it's just a broad uh, observation, which is, I think... Uh, Ask a question or, if you can. Yeah, the question, yeah. It's, a, it's a statement, so you, maybe you can respond to that statement, Mirai okay. or Dr. Joshi. So my own view is, when you say making markets work for the poor, actually ma you can't make the markets work for the poor. The markets work. But unfortunately, what happens is the poor get the wrong end of the market or the harsher end of the market. What we actually need to do, in fact, that's what I would like to respond on, that you have to make the poor work the markets. This is how do you build, and when you flip the, the statement, actually you have to, when you focus on the poor and the very poor, how do you make the poor, because who is the poor person in this country today? One is not able to play the markets or reach the market or even, quote unquote, work the markets. So how but do you teach make the, the poor, poor how to make the market the work for him? How do uh -huh. that, okay. it requires a lot of capacity building, yeah. investments, those sure. kind of things. Okay, so Param, maybe we'll start sure. with you. No, thanks for that feedback. So I have to tell you that there are a couple of ways in which uh, you know this issue is being addressed. In UP, and you spoke about Gorakhpur, so the Chief Minister, I've attended two very detailed review meetings with the Chief Minister, talking to all the collectors through video conference. He has given very specific directions that funds have to be transferred, like Mr. Chadda mentioned, through DBT. So the funds go directly to the beneficiary. Now, so that 12,000 rupees is transferred to the beneficiary. Uh, different states follow different models in terms of whether they give an advance or not. And there's total flexibility there. If you go to Chhattisgarh, they decide that unless the village becomes open defecation free, because you want to get that community action going. So there's, there's an incentive for the entire community to weigh in and say, we, we need to become open defecation free. So in Chhattisgarh, they decided the incentive would be paid after the village became ODF. In UP, they have given flexibilities. The different districts have different models. So one is the funds, and he's given very specific instructions. And he mentioned in the video conference that he has heard isolated cases where people have been demanding money. So he's cracking down on that. Money is being transferred electronically directly to the bank account. So that's one way to address this. The other is there is a transparency in terms of the list of households. So we've got an app called the Swatch app. There are, all the households are listed. We've got actual names of beneficiaries. And this is updated. So in a village, the community, in, individual household knows that they're entitled to that 12,000 rupees. They're going to demand it. So that's step one. They go and tell the Sarpanch, Mare Pesa ka kya hua? And then it's transferred to them. So I think a lot of measures have been taken. There will be isolated cases. But in UP, certainly these instructions have been passed. And most states are now following DBT. Power of DBT. Yoshi yeah. Okay, good. So there are two questions. I will try to club both the questions together. You know, agriculture right now is the uh, is some 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 sort of uh, way of life. So if we have to transform agriculture, we have to make it agri business profession. It's not an agri business profession. And when we say market for poor, I agree with you that market works for market. Uh, markets do not differentiate between rich and poor and they do not differentiate according to caste or religion. They work for market. Unless we intervene, unless government intervene in it, then uh, we, have, we have markets. So what I, I feel from the question which you are raising, one is the subsidy part. Well, huge subsidies are there, especially on fertilizer, seed, many states are giving on credit also. And then loan waiving is coming up. So the lots of issues are coming up. So one government is already piloting, you know, on, on fertilizer and the food also, uh, on how to transfer these subsidy direct cash transfer. And you know that the jam has been introduced. You have Jandan account, you have mobile, you have Aadhaar. So it will be linked. And I think that the saving from this aspect, the subsidies, 11 billion in fertilizer, around 8 billion in food. If we save this subsidy and then develop markets. In our country, markets are missing, unfortunately. We have not created markets over the years. Uh, so this is one area that we have to develop markets. The second area which I would like to touch that uh, on, uh, we should open now. As you rightly mentioned that, I will say that uh, the regime of MSP uh, should, you know, we should get rid of uh, regime of MSP. For, for rice and wheat, yes, we know because government has to procure, government has to fix some price, so there is, okay. But for other commodities where government is no, not procuring uh, any of the commodities, this year was the exception when pulses were procured, when the prices crashed like anything. So uh, I think government should withdraw from all these things and we should now focus on trade. 
and we should open our economy. Yeah. So, you know, when I personally go to Southeast Asian countries and they say that we want to participate in trade, they want to trade. When I come to South Asia, they say food security. Our mindset is still food security. We have now plenty of rice, plenty of wheat, we are not short. We have 80 million tons of, you know, stock of rice and wheat. So, what are we going to produce, only produce without marketing and prices are crashing? So, this is, you know, this is distorting our markets and also farmers are not getting right benefit. So, we need to open trade. I give you a simple example of Cambodia. Cambodia was a very poor country and during 2008 price spikes, most of the countries, you know, they blocked their exports. India was one which insulated completely from the rest of the world. And the, this country took advantage of the price spike. They started exporting rice. Paddy, virtually they do not compete in rice, but they started exporting paddy to Thailand. And the poverty has come down dramatically in that country. Vietnam is another country. So, you know, we have to open for trade of these commodities and we should identify markets like West Asia, Central Asia, Africa. These are the big markets which we need to tap now rather than depending only on the domestic market. Government should, you know, create enabling environment for export as well as for import also. And there should be a good monitoring system, price monitoring system and also what, how agriculture is behaving in the entire world that monitoring mechanism is needed now. It's a good note to, I think, uh, close this session on and talk about markets and thinking about trade policy afresh, especially for areas like agriculture, <laughs> where sometimes um, we haven't sort of looked at it from the farmer's perspective. Uh, so um, any last words, Roger, anything you take away from this discussion that you uh, would like to uh, reflect on? No, just it's been a real honor to be with you all. And, and obviously, Sewa, Dr. Joshi have had years of experience of seeing how this can be driven forward. And we've had a great partnership um, with Secretary Erie. So I, I, I'm excited about where it's going, and it's been a great honor to be here. Great. And I'm reminded of your, um, of your co-chair's call to action, which is be impatient optimists. Absolutely. <laughs> impatient, uh, but yet let's end on a note of optimism.